Hello, everybody. Tracy, Mrs. J-Dog Flanagan with you here today. I'm the co-founder and senior vice president of J-Dog Brands. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Tactical Treasures Podcast, powered by J-Dog and Vet TV. Our podcast gives veterans, male spouses, active military members, and military family members a voice in the veteran space to speak about their service, how they're affecting their communities post-service, and they share with me a tactical treasure that has shaped their past in their journey, in their military career, business, or life. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Mark Fisher who was a military brat and spent a large portion of his youth living in Germany, where his mother worked for the U.S. government and his stepfather served in the Army as a warrant officer. He attended high school in Germany and graduated from Stuttgart American High School. Mark says that military brats are a very accepting group. Everyone has been the new kid multiple times. It is why he still has friendships with people he has not seen in person in years. Mark belongs to military brat groups, which they call a fellowship. Only fellow military brats can genuinely understand the military brat way of life, its struggles, and what it is like to reacclimate to quote unquote real life. Mark connects with his fellow military brats through these groups, such as Stuttgart American Schools Alumni Association which he is a member after attending high school there and Facebook groups. Their shared camaraderie of military brat life keeps them connected through reunions and get-togethers. Yearly, Mark plans a trip back to Germany for Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner with the troops. Mark is an independent advisor working at Fisher Financial Management, where he creates retirement income strategies that helps individuals, regardless of their age, plan for and enjoy a comfortable future. He hopes to one day teach troops transitioning out how to plan for their financial future. Hello, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. And, and thank you for the legacy of service of your family and obviously you and your father and stepfather having served um, as well. So I'm excited to get into our discussion today and learn all about the military brat life through the eyes of a military brat. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity, Tracy. Tracy, as you know, I've been looking forward to it. Um, yeah. Having interaction with some of your staff members just a few years ago before COVID. So I was very interested in what you do. And I think it's a fantastic thing what you do for the community, for the veterans community. Oh, and I thank want to support you. you in any way I can. So thank you. I hope that my story can maybe reach some uh, former military brats that yeah. don't feel like they fit in uh, right now or they haven't been involved in alumni groups because maybe they only went to a school for one year. Uh, that, that doesn't have to be a concern. If they went to the school, they're a part of the school. Right, um, right. That's something that we're all very big about. Where my story kind of started was with my mother. Uh, my grandfather served in World War II, as many of our grandfathers did. Mm -hmm. uh, he was stationed in Germany. Uh, he actually fought in West Africa up through Sicily and then was at Bastogne, which is known as Battle of the Bulge in 1944. Right, right. Which I did not know until uh, close to my mother's uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away, but I did not know he served at Bastogne because I could not see his military records until just a few years ago. And I thought that was amazing, just a historical fact that my grandfather was there. But my mother loved living in Germany. And she was there in 1960 when the Berlin Wall went up as a teenager. And when we were here, my parents, my biological parents divorced and my mother was a teacher and she really thrived in Germany. And she felt like we needed a change. And so she took 11 year old me, which I give her tons of credit for because I shouldn't wow. have, it wasn't a lot of fun to deal with when I was 11 as I'm learning <laughs> teenagers are not fun at all anymore. But she took me and we went 4,000 miles away with uh, really no friends, no family, uh, just relying on the military community to take care of us. And that's wow. exactly what happens. Uh, you have a sponsor when you get there, they meet you, they make sure you're settled. And it's really, it, it's truly, I mean, fellowship is something that my friends really came up with more recently because we don't want to call ourselves like um, any, any other thing than what we are, like a family, but we wanted it to sound stronger and a fellowship. Sure, sure. But it's a bond that you share with people. As again, I said, even if you only went to the school for one year, you share a bond. Um, you know, 1984, moving to Germany, Berlin Wall is still up. Uh, Cold War is in full effect. Ronald Reagan had not yet given that famous speech, tear down that wall. And, you know, there was a very real possibility of you know, nuclear war, sadly, at that time. 
Yeah, but yeah, sure. It, it, when you go to live in a country that uh, you know depended on us because we did liberate the entire country, we were very important to them. We had uh, tons of bases, uh, probably over 100,000 troops at one point, maybe more in all of Europe. I'd heard higher numbers, but I don't want to comment on numbers I can't confirm. But sure. it was all designed for the purpose of being at the front line, which was 40 miles away from the Grafenbeer training area where we lived. Wow. Uh, and that's just not something as an 11 year old, it hits you. As a 51 year old, it absolutely hits you. Uh, sure. Because you sure. get the full scope of everything and you start to look at the map. Uh, something, yes, you, we all did in the 80s because we didn't have a uh, wonderful GPS or anything. But when you really look at how close I was and we all lived to history, and then we lived history with the Berlin Wall coming down. But up until 1989, we literally had moments where there would be, in 86, we bombed Libya because they were blowing up, sadly, they were blowing up airplanes. Airplanes sure. which we had to fly on if we wanted to travel back to the States to visit family. So yeah. that was always in the back of your mind when you got on a plane. I can't tell you how many times I've had two and three searches to get on an airplane just to be safe, which... I'm always for, I want to be safe all the time. Um, but you know, having that in 1986, bombing Libya, it took us five hours to get to school that day because they searched every vehicle, top to bottom. Wow. Getting on the base. I honestly didn't, thinking back, don't know why we went, but I understand that you know, we're there, we're living day to day. We, everybody has a job, everybody goes to school, plays sports. It's fairly a normal growing up. It's just in a foreign country. 4, right. miles surrounded uh, by troops, American troops that are deployed there. That's a, a that's yes. a little bit of different from, you know, I, I'm sure other military brats might not be that close to the front line or, right. or amongst, you know, they're on a base or they're not intermixed with walking down the street with American soldiers there, right? In Germany. Walking down the street and a tank coming up the road. Right. During, during yeah. what was called Winter Reforger, which was basically a wintertime training exercise. And the tanks would literally be in our backyards. I, I did not live on the base. I lived on what we call the German economy, uh, which was a wonderful experience because I was immersed in, in Germany and in their just their, their beliefs are so much different than ours. Obviously their history is very important to them and not repeating it, which was always something I've never forgotten. I've met wow. people that, you know, being there in the eighties, I met my German friend who I met in 1984 and we are still friends today. This will be 40 years. We've been friends well, come October, wow. you know, come August. That's and amazing. Actually had him over here last year. We kind of bonded on born in the USA, Bruce Springsteen. Um, <laughs> And I talk about him and I want to talk about the, the first year we were there real quick, uh, simply because it, it's a negative story, but it has a positive ending. My mother was in a car accident four months after we got there. Snowstorm, it was a horrible situation. She wow. survived, but it was a very, very bad wreck. The point of the story is I was 11 years old with no grandparents within hours driving, no way to get my father from the States there. I hadn't met my stepfather yet. I met him when I was 13. Um, so I immediately was by myself, but we had military neighbors below us. The wife showed up at my door. My German friend showed up at the door. My new friend who'd only known me for three months. And then I spent probably the next two or three or four days being taken care of by a German family, then passed off to one military family to another military family to get me to the hospital where she was, which was at the time in Nuremberg, which was about an hour away, and wow. to see her. And then they made sure I got on an airplane to fly back for Christmas time to be with my father. And when I went back, they picked me up at the airport and made sure I got back to my mother. It was like, it was like they were breathing. It was like water for them. It was so easy. Right. It, yeah. Obviously very used to it. And we, we do support each other even to this day, but when, you can tell a story like that it emphasizes that as we speak, there are children going to school. Well, not as we speak, they're at home now, but they're going to school in a foreign land where Americans may or may not be as popular as we think they are. Right. And again, it's nothing to do with what the kids are doing, but anybody says something the wrong way, it could negatively impact our lives. 
And we did have to worry about discotheques and, and bars being blown up. We had to worry about fests being attacked. There was always a threat level, but we just lived. You know, we didn't let it bother us. Um, right. Probably should have, but there was no anxiety and we weren't getting, yes, we were always getting reminded by the commanders and by our parents and even the, the daily troops that I interacted with. I played basketball with the guys. It was wonderful. They were all 18. I was 16. We were close in age. And we right. just played basketball for hours and had a great time. Yeah. But it, it really showed me what it's like to be accepted just for being an American. Right. Because that's the way we look at ourselves. We're yeah. just Americans in a foreign land who need to get each other's support. Have someone looking, watching your back. Right. And I really felt it, like we had that. Yeah. And, you know, there's always so much talk about camaraderie, right, amongst the veteran community um, because of, of the shared experience, right? I think it's the same as, you know, the military brat community has its own camaraderie because, again, it's, an, it's a shared experience where you get one another and you understand one another. And, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure you're talking a lot about your time in Germany. And I, I wonder, what is it like? I'm sure there's struggles mm -hmm. and trying to reacclimate to life. I mean, after you came back from Germany, like how did, how did that transition happen for you? And what was that like? That was uh, more difficult than I ever expected. And a lot of my friends and I, I was surprised even 30 plus years later, we share the same opinion that reintegrating back to day-to-day -to -day American life with, you know, unfortunately with people that didn't have our experience. So relating to it was difficult. And I understand that, sure. um, especially back then we didn't have the internet and it wasn't as easily accessible, but it, it just came back to a small town, even though you know, my father lived in the small town I came back to. I really was only here for a month, month and a half during the summer, and then I was back in Europe. So I really got no footing as far as friendships or really any any groups that I got to associate with because I was really focused on my groups and my friends and, and everything sure. in Germany. And teen, about year, teen years are difficult too, you know? Teen years are, are a difficult space to navigate in, in and of itself, let alone with this added, you know, military life. <laughs> that you obviously experienced, right? Yeah, age 11 to 18 were the years that I spent in Germany growing up. Uh, some of my friends yeah. were there at a lot younger ages. Uh, some went seven or eight when they started their uh, trek as a military brat. Um, but it, it really it was amazing in a sense that you kind of grew up a lot faster, I want to say, and I don't want to say sure. that negatively towards anybody else, but because of the situation we were in, we had to be aware. We had to understand our place in the world. And again, we can't always count on being popular, but we like to fit in. We make efforts. I learned the language. I unfortunately have lost it over the last 30 years, but I try to pick right. it up as best I can every time I go to visit. But you're right. We have the same problems as teenagers here in the States, except that your girlfriend's dad or mom could get orders and she's gone in six months and there's nothing right. you can do about it. Right. Um, they could be going to Korea from Germany. You just don't know. Uh, but that is something that we all came to accept. And that is something that uh, all of us, uh, again, it was not the funnest part. You always would like to have that, that boy or girlfriend all the way through your high school years. Uh, some people do here in America. And I know a lot of people who are still married to their high school sweetheart. And it's great. But we just weren't presented with the same parameter of opportunities with that. Uh, our stays were limited. I went to two different high schools. I went uh, freshman and 10th grade to Vilsack High School, which is near Grafenmuir, Germany, which is the base that we lived at. It's our largest training area, which has exploded in size in the last 15 years. It's right. absolutely gigantic um, and modern. And we, we are training the Ukrainian troops there. I was just there in December, which is why I brought that up. They were day and night. And that's the one thing about being a military brat they opened a live fire range behind our house in Germany. Oh, and oh it, wow. And, and it was for howitzers. So there's metal Roladens on the windows that come down in Germany. It makes it dark because during the summer in Germany, it's night, it's light to 11 o'clock at night. 
and these Jolans keep in the, the coolness or the heat. But when the tanks fire, they shake. They get sucked oh in and gosh. out with the whoosh. And you just got used to it. You just never heard it. It was like, if you didn't hear it, it's like the people who live in New York City, it's loud. So if they go somewhere quiet, they can't sleep. That's kind of right. how it was. <laughs> um, and, and I have a funny story about my, my father coming to visit and he's in the spare bedroom and we're all out in the living room doing our normal day-to-day -day life and the range starts up. We don't notice it. He comes bulking out of the bedroom. What's going on? I just looked at him and said, tax dollars at work, dad, what are you going to do? And he said, yeah, Is that close. I'm like, just over the hill. Uh, but yeah, it really was. And to this day, wow. when you're near the train area, you hear it uh, and you can hear the 50 caliber guns. We are active and it is very amazing how we do it. Wow. Just wow. Truly so we, we, we talked about, you know, military brats, the camaraderie and the, the fact that you call yourselves a fellowship. So you belong to a military brat group. And, you know, I've, I've never, I've never heard of that, you know, that that is available. So, um, I would love to hear, talk to us about that. What is that like? How did, how did you come up, up across that? And are there, you know, several military brat groups, how would you find them? It really, I have to give a lot of props to the, the people uh, that put it together years back. We had a former teacher who was very instrumental in getting us together for our 15th reunions. I graduated high school in 91. She, Patricia Hine was her name. She did a fantastic job. She now passed it down to my generation and we're all working very hard to plan our reunion, which will be in Florida in July this year. We had one, we were able to work one out during COVID uh, in Nashville because our high school was on Pattonville Barracks in Stuttgart, Germany, which closed. Right. Now yeah. Stuttgart is okay. still there. It's a different high school now. It's Patch High School, which was at Stuttgart High School when we were there. It was kind of like a competing school for us, which is a little right. strange, but man, we, we all learned to deal with it. But we've all actually combined even the Patch people into our reunion into our fellowship. So the Stuttgart okay. American High School Fellowship has Ludwigsburg High School, Ludwigsburg Elementary School. These are all towns in Germany where we had schools that are long since gone. Uh, right, but if you went right. to that school, you can go on Facebook and type it in. And nine times out of 10, I'll bet you'll find a group dedicated to that school or dedicated right. to okay. the base of army, of army brats and okay. people and Air Force and Marine, you name it, they exist. There's general brat sites. Facebook is very good with this. Facebook okay. has really been instrumental in keeping us going because as the internet picked up, we were all kind of getting out of college at the time and right, still communicating right. with the old phone numbers and writing hand letters and things like that. Sure. But once that happened, it made it a lot easier to reach out to people and organize these kind of things. Um, right. And it has been... It's like going to someplace, seeing somebody you haven't seen in 30 years, but it's like you saw them yesterday. You pick up as if you've been hanging out for the last 30 years, even though it's been 30 years since you saw each other. And you sure, may have only spent sure. a year. In some of the cases, I only, I only spent two years at Stuttgart High School, and I'm still very close to people I only lived two years with. Right. Um, again, when something happens, we're all there to support each other. We sadly had friends pass away, parents pass away. And we've been there for each other. Um, I've been to Arlington twice now for friends, for fathers and tournaments. Wow. Uh, and it's just amazing how many fellow brats show up. Like at the last yeah. one, I think we had 20. 20 fellow classmates from multiple years showed up to support our friend whose dad was being laid to rest. And from across the country. And, and it was truly an amazing, amazing just time to be there. It felt very home feeling, felt like family. And that's always, that's the kind of feeling I'm trying to get across. The fellowship part does mean family, but it's bigger than that. Right, it's something sure. where you can talk to someone about your deepest, darkest concerns and you're safe. You just feel like you're in a yeah. safe place because we've yeah. all been there. Um, right. You know, we've all had to experience change where it's wanted, unwanted. We've had to deal with, uh, sadly, the first Gulf War, I went my senior year of high school. I remember my 18th birthday, my mother waking me up saying that 
bombs were dropping and that she had to go to work because she ran all the youth services at the time. Wow. And we didn't have school for four days. And then when we had school, we had fully armed military MPs on our bus, military police, fully armed. Wow. Battle fatigues, automatic weapons, they had everything. And then we had guards around us every day. But the biggest thing was all of my friends, mothers and fathers were deployed to Saudi Arabia at the time, getting ready to invade uh, Kuwait and Iraq to save Kuwait. Right. When that happened, it was, we felt more connected, I think. Obviously, yeah. you saw a lot of friends deal with a lot of deep emotions and a lot of deep fears, things that I, I really have said to them, you know, I hope that I, I supported you well enough because my mother was not deployed, but right. my mother would tell me what it was like for my grandfather being deployed during World War II in Korea. So she had a little bit of an understanding on how difficult that was. So she did play a big role in trying to guide me on how to be there to support them a little better. Because that's what you right. want to do. You want to be a support. Sure. You don't want to be a downer. You don't want to be picking on anybody. You want to laugh and have fun and have a good time. And we really right. had fun. I mean, we, we were treated like adults. We could go to, to a beer fest, wine fest legally. And we weren't driving. Wow. We were always taking a train. We were taught very early on. And again, imagine military life. It wasn't if the street lights came on. No, it's if you didn't pay attention to the clock and you to get home. Then you were in yeah, trouble right. in military life. The street lights here in the United States, I understand that rule. It's a great rule. But in military life, it was a little bit different. It was more of a time thing. Right. Uh, and I, I do remember breaking my curfew one night and being waited for when I came home. And I just walked right up to her and said, I'm sorry, Mom, I, I messed up. I won't ask to go out for the next two weeks. And I went to bed. And I think she left, she was staying in there stunned for another 15 minutes. But that was your rule. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, actually, you actually punished yourself. <laughs> I owned it. I owned it. I mean, right. I knew that was the punishment. I knew that I screwed up and I missed the last taxi cab. So I missed the time to get home. Yeah. I had to wait for yeah. someone to drive me. And yeah, she was not happy, but she was very happy that I followed her punishment without question. Right. And, yeah. you know, she was very straight with that because she was a military brat herself. So she yeah, wanted me sure. to experience it the same way she did. Yeah. Meeting yeah. Germans, inter interacting in the German community. And right. it just doesn't, it goes beyond my friend. I mean, I still call his mom, mom. Um, right. And, sure. and we call, yeah, you know, we call some of our friends, American friends, moms, mom, and things like that. You know, it's just the way we talk about each other because it's all part of the same group. Right. <laughs> I was just going <laughs> to say, it, it's just a, a coming together of like-minded people with like-minded experiences yeah. and being able to sit in a room uh, like we did. And I, I didn't come up with the term fellowship. A good friend of mine did. And I, I didn't get a chance to ask her for her, her permission to use her name. But she and some other friends are also interested in talking to you uh, if the opportunity comes who actually served after being a military brat and can oh. share different stories about that. Yeah, I'd but, love to love to have viewers and listeners. Are you a military veteran or a military family member and looking to own your own business? If so, go to jdog.com and check out our two veteran-focused franchises, JDog Junk Removal and Hauling and JDog Carpet Cleaning and Floor Care. Our franchisees nationwide are always looking to hire fellow veterans and patriots. JDog is the world's largest military franchise system with hundreds of locations nationwide. We are nearly 90% veteran-owned with the goal of reducing the veteran unemployment rate to under 1%. Check us out. Go to jdog.com to learn more. Now, back to the podcast. So you're a financial advisor now, um, and I think you, you, you kind of have a desire to help veterans um, as they transition uh, in navigating the, that financial future. Yes. I, 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 how, how, how's that going? It, it's not as easy as one would think. Um, years ago, I, I used a relationship with a local congressman who was mm -hmm. part of the intelligence, uh, uh, I forget the committee in, in Congress, but he helped me get out onto McGuire and Fort Dix. And I just wanted to talk about putting money away for college. I wasn't trying to sell anything or a product. I just wanted to educate. Unfortunately, not that right. many people attended, uh, but it was a different time. Um, it was early 2000s. Uh, I always, when someone's retiring, I offer up, hey, if you want to ask, if you want to ask if what you're doing currently, if you don't feel like it's good, it's all private. I don't charge to review your stuff. I just want to make sure that you're being treated properly. Um, and right. it's the best day for me is to come back and say everything's perfect. 
guy guy or, yeah. or woman that's working for you is doing the best best they can right i can't see a reason sure. to change and that's the yeah. best case scenario for me and i have found yeah. that a few times and it, it's amazing to to see how it, the younger troops are not getting the education though that they need even p active duty they're all getting these massive bonuses to stay and I remember being in my 20s and if somebody gave me a large chunk of money, I'd probably want to buy my favorite sports car if I could. Sure. Uh, and yeah. the fact that they're doing what they do for a living and that they could be sent downrange, is what we call being deployed at any moment, they should enjoy yeah. themselves. But they also right. should think about, okay, what happens next? And that's the one message that I want to get across is it's wonderful and perfectly acceptable to treat yourself when you're doing such a difficult job, putting literally putting your life on the line for your country and it, getting the money is well earned and well deserved. Doing something for your future with it is something that's just not being taught to them. They're, they don't have yeah. people coming in. And I was over there again in December and I offered to go in and speak to some younger troops in their late twenties, early thirties. Couldn't make it work on the short time frame that I had that I was there, but sure. I definitely made myself available and I'm still available if they want to reach out. Um, right. Just giving people that helping hand to not be afraid to ask a question that they may not ask because they don't want to be looked at as being uninformed or just sure really stupid in a way. And I always tell people there is no such thing as a stupid question. It's the one not yeah. asked is probably the stupid question. Sure. And yeah. I, again, I tell people you can ask me 10 times until you understand it because I can probably explain different things 10 different ways. That's my job is to educate. Uh, people think financial advisor, they think, oh, makes money and moves on to the next. I like to manage the relationships. I like to create almost my own little fellowship of clients. And I've been very lucky that I'll be self-employed 20 years, April 1st. And I have wow. clients that I've had for 25 years. And I'm on the third That's generations. Great. And I go to them. I do not spend money on a fancy office. I do not see the point. I like to go to their house, go to their office, go to their favorite restaurant favorite coffee shop, because you want people to be as comfortable as possible when talking about their finances. Sure. Everyone gets so nervous and so defensive. I'm not here to judge. I may do it for a living, but that doesn't mean I'm perfect either. Uh, again, right. I said, if I was in my 20s and you gave me 100 grand tax free, I would probably want to go buy <laughs> something fun. Um, yeah, right. So everything everybody would, I think you agree. Um, <laughs> yeah, you right. Know, especially sure. You don't have kids or anything and you're just starting your life like, oh, hey, I'm gonna have some fun. So please yeah. do it, but also think about that there's other options to make that money work for you later on in life. Right. Take away right. some of that burden yeah. of having to worry once you get out of the military. All right, what am I going to do now? Can I go to school? Can I travel for a little bit? What can I do? That's kind of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about putting right. money away, not necessarily for a rainy day, but for the future with a goal in mind. Sure. With a goal yeah. in mind. Um, yeah. And I, and I really want to get that across to guys that there's just no, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Nothing wrong. Sure. Yeah. So um, now we come to your tactical treasure, Mark. I would love to hear what you're going to share with us today. Tactical treasure. The, the treasure is my friends. It's just the friends. They're the treasure uh, because they're all special in their own way. I have a different relationship. Uh, not with all of them, I'm pretty similar with the majority, but some of us just feel more comfortable talking to one or the other. And I'm fortunate right. that I have a few people that we really click when we talk and we support each other through and through. Um, I mentioned earlier when we were talking, I found out a good friend, actually an ex-girlfriend from the 10th grade, uh, came down with horrible cancer. And as soon as I found out, I sent her a message directly on Facebook because I wanted her to know that even though we haven't seen each other since 1989, I said 1989, not 2009, that right. she still mattered because there was mm -hmm. birthdays that she always remembered. My mom actually followed her on Facebook. And when my mom passed away, she immediately sent me a message. And it's just, it, it felt natural to do. Uh, so to send that message. Right. And when I had another buddy who, was, who served, who's now retired, but still working for the government, had a good buddy he served with who sadly committed suicide. And when I saw he posted wow. that, I called him. I, I didn't 
yeah. and sent him a message. I called him to say, hey, how are you doing? And we talked yeah. and he's been supportive of me. In fact, I owe him a return call because it's share and share alike. Um, right. Truly. Right. And on every level, uh, as I said, we've gone to Arlington to support our friends, parents being interned and from all over the country. I was there two years previously for uh, a friend from the Vilsack Grafenbeer area for her dad. And all their, all right. these dads, I knew them uh, when I was growing up and saw the sure. moms and we, I'm even helping one of the, the moms with the finances that she was left. Uh, it's just right. something I feel is, is the treasure is if I didn't have those relationships to fall back on, if I didn't know those people were still out there, it, it's literally like my small town, but it's, it's spread out everywhere around the world. It's spread out. Yeah. 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 I get you. Um, so what, that's really amazing. Um, what advice would, would you give to fellow military brats that, you know, may be struggling with that reacclimation to real life, um, you know, after, you know, service, you know, maybe parents retired and they're coming back to, you know, regular life in the States or, or they're just adults and, and, you know, making their way in the world you know, separate from their parents, you know what that struggle's like. What advice would you have for them? With what's available online right now, I would most certainly go on Google and type in military brat associations, military brat groups. There are brat groups for bases that no longer exist. Heidelberg, for example, is closed, but there was a Heidelberg High School. So there is a Heidelberg uh, (laughs) reunion group. Uh, there's there's a whole bunch of of dedicated pages that are strictly to certain bases, certain areas of the country and of the world uh, that we just don't think about. Uh, people who went wow. in Okinawa or in Korea or you know maybe in Hawaii um, or Alaska or you can even go as far down as into Italy. Uh, people have been literally all over the world, and you just don't know until you try. I would just go in. Google works so well for certain things, and that's the best way. But Facebook as well. I have found strictly military brat focused groups. Then I've found groups focused on, I mentioned Vilsack High School. I actually follow the actual Vilsack High School that is still active today because it is on such a, a large training area with a massive amounts of military families that are there uh, still living the same way that I did, having to get onto a secure installation every day to go to school and go to work. Please know that these are accepting groups. These are groups that want you to come. We're always trying to get people who aren't involved in our uh, association to start getting involved again. And we have people that show up after 30 years of no contact and it's wonderful. Right. I mean, it's just like, oh, it's great to see you. How you been? And it's, there's no animosity. There's no, why haven't you been in touch? It's just like, so happy you're here and you're, you're welcome the same way you were previously. Uh, I've never never felt any, any different than that. And again, as as we've gotten older, we've all really, I think, realized it more. That's been the general consensus and the conversations I've had both previously and leading up to this uh, podcast was to get other people's interpretations to make sure that I wasn't leaving anything out. So some of the things I may have mentioned don't directly apply to me, but they've certainly come from other people that I know and that I've heard because you get moved in the middle of the summer, sophomore to junior high school, and you're going from a small school to a big school. It's like, wow. And I remember I went to a party. I went with a couple of people and I met a whole bunch of people and I was kind of in, and that's how school started. Yeah. I don't remember being a difficult entry. I remember it just being a, oh, you went to Vilsack? Oh, yeah, well, we beat them in sports, that kind of thing. You know, that's right, the normal sure. kind of high school thing that we still had. We still had those rivalries and things like that, that we tried to keep yeah. as, a, as an American thing. But the Germans have them too. Let's, let's be fair. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> true. But those, true. those things, you know, you weren't, you weren't judged because you went to a competitive competitor school. Uh, we, we accepted each other as one. And uh, that, that's just the best part of it. Being, right. being one, That's not, great. not worrying about anything else. Uh, because you know, again, we were in a foreign land and we were the only Americans there and we had to, to watch sure. each other's backs. We had to be there for each other. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's really great. Mark, this has been amazing. This has been so insightful. Um, I, you know, even within, you know, the veteran community, you know, with J-Dog and everything, um, I've met military brats, right? Um, but I, I never have, I heard stories or, you know, understood what all that entailed, you know? So thank you so much for coming on and enlightening us as to just what military life, you know, for a military brat is like. Oh, my um, pleasure. So this, was, I have to tell you, it was the greatest this has time been amazing. It was the greatest time of my life. Uh, it was, I lived right. history. I learned. I experienced. May have had to grow up a little quicker than the normal teenager, but I honestly think that right. was a positive. Um, my yeah. father, my biological father mentioned to me, he served during Vietnam, but got out. Um, but he, he mentioned to me two years ago that it was probably the greatest experience I ever had because it showed me the world. It didn't just focus right. on New Jersey or Pennsylvania or Philadelphia. Right. It was the sure. world. And that, yeah. that is something that when you can live it and experience it, you appreciate it even more. And you, you just appreciate the experiences you had and that it made me this person that is driven to succeed, have my own business. I've been fortunate, uh, but I've also been understanding of sacrifice and understanding that sometimes things don't go the way you want and you just got to refocus and go for it again. Uh, that sure. was another thing that I yeah. learned, uh, especially from my mother, was if you get knocked down, get back up. Uh, you know, that car right. accident she was in, she could have just laid down, but she said, nope, I'm going back to work. And she went with a cast on her leg and you know, went went to work that Christmas right after it. Uh, but yeah. you really do yeah. get this 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 fellowship and this familyness. It's the biggest family I have, and I know it's there for me, and they know that I'm there for them. And by, it, it goes across the board. And I'm there for yeah, two different that's schools. Really, that, that's the thing for me. Yeah, that, right. And I talked to one friend. She went to four different high schools uh, right. because of her father's yeah. job. She was constantly getting moved around. One actually, I think, was a junior right. high school. So I apologize. Not four total high schools, but it was a junior high school. Yeah. But you really, wow. you never know what you're going to get. And you got to be able to adapt. And if you can't adapt, I really didn't meet anybody that couldn't. So uh, I have right. to say it was a great thing. I yeah, can't, I can't stop saying great thing because it really was. I, I, I look back on yeah. it with such pride, but with such fond memories and experiences that uh, I was so lucky to have. So lucky yeah. to have. But again, the one thing I did want to make clear about military life is our parents had jobs. They got up every day and went to work. They certainly had a commander. They didn't have a boss. So there was no arguing about things. Um, right. Some of the commanders have gone on to do fantastic things and uh, have been on local news uh, one of the commanders, uh, General Honore, did Katrina recovery, went to high school with his daughter. Uh, right. And he was a phenomenal man back then. <laughs> Talk about intimidating. But it's just the respect that you, you get for, for what people do for their country, for their family, without, without question. They just do it. That right. is it. And, you know, but again, we, we were experiencing the Alps. We were experiencing the foreign countries. But we were going to school and doing our lives just like you were here, except the setting was completely different. That's all. Yeah, I would slightly, say so. Slightly, but I, I, I just want yeah. to get that across to people. If I tell a story about going to Austria, well, Austria was an hour away. It was like going to central Pennsylvania <laughs> yeah. for me or, you know, going to Allentown or going right. to New York. Sure, sure. That's how close yeah. it was. So that's when I talked yeah. about the map earlier. Uh, the one thing I wanted to bring up as Chernobyl happened in 1986. And when it blew up, it was 600 miles away. It was as close as South Carolina is to us now. Wow. I didn't realize that until the HBO documentary came out and I Googled it. And I'm <laughs> admitting that. I'm admitting I was that kind of dense about it where being a kid. I yeah, right. That. Sure. But I remember my yeah. biological father calling my mother and saying, um, CNN just said there's a toxic cloud headed to Germany. And she went, yeah, what are we going to do? Not breathe? That was the sad truth of it. We couldn't do anything oh about it. Oh my gosh. The Russians wow. Yeah. They never told us, if you know the history of it, they never told us. Yeah. So we were just exposed. And it just happened. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, when the Berlin Wall came oh. down, seeing families get reunited, my German friend's mother's family was separated by the wall for 30 years. Seeing that, wow. oh, that, that, you can't put a price on that. That That's had to be quite a defining, yeah, that had to be a very impactful moment, I'm sure. And, and it felt like a huge accomplishment being an American because, and not to toot the American horn, but we did have a lot to do with that. 
you know, Ronald Reagan's sure. famous speech did all that. And, yeah. And you know, yeah. just to see that happen and see a country reunify and see people that were separated by this horrible wall for so many years get reunited. Yeah. That That's right. just kind of the icing on the cake of the American story from the 80s is what we did to yeah. help unify and free Europe free people that yeah. were living right. oppress oppression and now they're able to go to Italy if they want, go to Spain if they want, right. come here if yeah. they want. Uh, yeah. It's a true, true, uh, true mark in history that I was just amazing to live, amazing to be a part of and just continuing to kind of support the people that made it happen. You know, my friends yeah. and yeah. obviously my, my stepfather and my friend's parents, we, we all really are there for each other. A lot of parents right, are on the Facebook right. pages, which gets very interesting sometimes, but yeah, I'm sure it does. <laughs> uh, That's neat. But it's very um, cool. I could go on forever. So please tell me to. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is, as I said, this has been just amazing. Um, so before you go, if people want to find and connect with you, maybe, you know, um, for some financial advice, <laughs> um, or to help, help them navigate finding a military brat group. Um, is there an email or is there a way that they can get in touch with you? I do have a website for my business. Uh, that's Fisher, okay. Fisher financial management. Uh, the website, actually I can send it to you. It's uh, Fisher. I'm sorry. It was recently updated. I have to look at what <laughs> just called it. I had to change the name because I had it as Fisher wealth management and there's a Fisher wealth management in North Carolina. The only thing oh, saying wow. is the last name, but they have one client in New Jersey. So I had to change it to Fisher Financial Management. Ah, but my website okay. is fisherwealthmanagemgt.com. And that is okay. my website. You can get in touch with me for military reasons that way. You can send me an email. Uh, on Facebook, I kind of keep myself a little private. Uh, I'd be only on sure. there for the social part of it. I don't put my business on there. I am on LinkedIn. Yeah. Mark J. Fisher okay. in Mount Holly, New Jersey, under Fisher Financial Management, and I have a big presence on LinkedIn. They can reach out to me that way. Send me a message. Okay. Uh, again, any, any way I can help somebody. If somebody reaches out to you and uh, wants to know, please uh, get in touch with me immediately, and, and I'll be happy to reach I will. out. I'll send them your way. But yeah, I really, uh, Mark, any, and again, anything I can do for, for financial education, it's not for me to make money. It's for me to give back. That, that's what I want to do yeah. with it. I'm not trying to add to my That's business great. or add to my income. I just want to repay the people that I know how they lived and I know what they did. And I think they deserve a helping hand. And it's not, not pure charity. It's because I really want to help. I, I think I can help my kids. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Mark, this has just been amazing. Um, thank you so much for giving us a, a, a bird's eye view into uh, your life as a military brat over in Germany. Um, it, it's, it's just been amazing. Thank you for sharing everything and thank coming on, on the podcast. Thank you again, Tracy. Again, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity and thrilled to be in touch with you and hope we can work together in the future. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello viewers and listeners. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Tactical Treasures Podcast. We've just finished up a very enlightening conversation with Mark Fisher, who was a military brat and spent a large portion of his youth living in Germany. He has given us a look at the military life through the eyes of a military brat. His message is to let other military brats know they are not alone in the difficulty of reacclimating to quote unquote real life. Military brats understood what it meant when their parents got orders moving. Mark went to two different high schools in Germany. He remembers moving to Stuttgart and going to school, meeting everyone, and he was in. Military brats are a very accepting group. Everyone has been the new kid multiple times. It has been said that we are like fellowship. Only fellow military brats can genuinely understand that life and what it is like. There are military brat groups all across the country. They can be found by searching on Google military brat groups or military brat organizations, which will bring up military brat Facebook groups and other organizations such as Brats Without Borders. Thank you so much again for joining us. And don't forget, you can find Tactical Treasures podcasts on all your favorite podcast streaming platforms, as well as Vet TV. We are now airing on Reese Across America Radio on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. And if you missed that, join us for the encore 
on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can also find Reese Across America Radio on the High Art Radio app, the Odyssey app, and the TuneIn app. Also, we are so proud to share that our J-Dog Foundation is a Reese Across America sponsorship group. For each $17 Veterans Wreath you sponsor, $5 goes directly back to the J-Dog Foundation, whose mission is to prevent veteran suicide and heal veterans' mental health and PTSD. You can donate right now at reeseacrossamerica.org slash J-Dog. Again, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again on another podcast real soon. Bye-bye now.